Good evening, everyone. Hopefully you're doing well today. And we want to say that we're thankful that you have joined with us to um, uh, be with us here for Thursday night in the Word. Um, we just thank God for His Word. His truth sets us free. And we just uh, want to uh, dig in a little bit tonight. Uh, we're talking about the uh, six foundational doctrines that's found in Hebrews chapter 6. Those doctrines are repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Tonight, we're going to start on the subject of the resurrection of the dead. We know there's a lot of we know that there's a lot of um, opinions. Uh, we want to do our best to share with you what the Word says. Um, we do understand that we know in part prophesy in part, so we don't claim to have a complete, total understanding of everything. We believe God will continue to give us more and more revelation as we go along, but uh, we want to share with you concerning this uh, foundational doctrine because it's important. The resurrection of the dead is important for us to know, even though most Christians shy away from eschatology and the end times. The Bible teaches us that it is important for us to know um, what the Scripture is talking about. And so um, a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight, um, we will look at through the eyes and lens of revelations. But tonight we're just going to lay basically kind of a foundation, an introduction to um, the resurrection of the dead, and then you know we will continue to progress on through that over the next several um, weeks probably, um, but as we, you know, begin tonight talking about this, we um, want to focus our attention <clears throat> on these last two um, doctrines. And um, you know, when we look at the times and the things that are going on right now in the world it causes us to pause and think, and sometimes it causes us to maybe wish we knew more about end-time scriptures and and what God was doing in this hour and what's happening. And, and so we, we see that um, it's very important for us to educate ourselves and what's happening at this time, bibli the biblical aspects of what's taking place, so that we can be aware. The Bible says that uh, we're not to be taken as though we were asleep. Or <clears throat> we're not to be drunk as others. Uh, but we are to be awake, alert. He, he tells us we don't know the day or the hour that the Son of Man comes. But yet we can know the season or the times. Uh, we know that in, the, in Jesus' day when he came here, uh, was born of a virgin dwelt among men, um, we know that one of the biggest problems and the reason why he was the hardest on the religious people is because, because of the prophets and those who were declaring his coming, um, they should have known the very time in which Jesus was to be born. And I believe that God wants us to know um, that we're very close to the coming of the Lord and that we have to make ourselves ready. Do not make the mistake of thinking that just because you're born again, that that is going to be enough for you to escape what's coming upon this earth. The Bible says that we were to go and make ourselves ready. Uh, he was talking to people that had given their hearts to Jesus, but there was still something they had to do, and that was prepare themselves. Um, laying aside every weight and sin, not haphazardly serving God, or flippantly serving the Lord, but dedicating themselves um, to the truth of God's word and applying themselves to live out, walk out this gospel, to be a light to the world and to um, uh, have your heart and life developed to where we're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ every day. And so it's important for us um, that we really dig in um, to the truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. And so even though we know that there are a lot of different views, we want, I want to just ask you to be careful 
that um, your idea or your theology does not cause you to close your ears or your mind off to what might be said. Um, we know that those things can be a hindrance in us receiving, and so it's important that we do not allow ourselves just to be so focused on the tradition of men or focused on just what we've been taught, but to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. Because I, I want to tell you, I, I'm leery of the dogma or the person that says they've got it all figured out. They have all the answers. But I, I don't I don't believe there's anybody that's got it all figured out. I think we can come close. I think we can do the best we can and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us. But I don't believe we have it all figured out. And so when we talk about um, uh, the resurrection of the dead, we, of course, look into and we talk a lot about the book of Revelation. A lot of people don't like to talk about the Revelation uh, or Revelations. They don't think it's something that they can understand. But um, because our study of these last two doctrines will cause us to use many scriptures from the book of Re the Revelation, it is important that we have a basic understanding of this book. Therefore, we will now take time to give kind of like a basic overview of the revelation. There's three common fallacies that we want to address concerning our ability to understand and interpret this book and the end time events that need to be addressed at the outset of our study. And here they are. The book, the, the very first misunderstanding or fallacy is the book cannot be understood at this time. The second one is, this book does not apply to the Christian walk now. And the third fallacy is, this book is written in chronological order. When we look at Revelations 1 through 3, we clearly it clearly convinces us that God's intention is that we understand this prophetic book and that the truths of this book have been relevant to the Christian walk since approximately 95 A.D. Revelations 1, 1 through 3 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which, most, which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So we can see that God fully expects us to read it and understand it and to live it and walk it out. Um, the key verse in this entire book that helps us to understand this prophecy, especially with regard to its chronological order, is found in Revelations 1.19. Um, this passage of scripture says, write, these, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So when we look at this, we can see that John was instructed to write about the past, the things which thou hast seen, the present, the things which are, and the future, the things which shall be hereafter. This clearly divides the prophetic book into three parts. Revelations 1 deals with the, the past or what John had previously seen. Revelations 2 and 3 deal with the present condition of, uh, that was in 95 AD of the seven churches. We know that the seven churches, he gives us, he gives us a literal view of, of the seven churches there and states their condition and where they're at. And then he comes back in Revelations 4, 1 and shows that the rest of this book deals with future or things um, which must be hereafter or after 95 AD. The one puzzle piece that needs to be added to understand the prophetic, prophetic events of this book is that the story of the future is told twice. The story of the future is told twice, once from God's perspective and once from man's perspective. From a heavenly viewpoint, God tells us 
what's going to take place. And from an earthly viewpoint, he tells us. Uh, Revelations 4 through 11 tells the story from a heavenly viewpoint. In Revelation, starting at Revelations 4 all the way up through Revelation 11, it's giving us um, God's view of what is going to take place and what's going to happen. And then we see Revelations 12, which is a parenthetic. It's like a, it's like a parenthesis in the middle that states to you a summary or this, this is something that you need to see here. It, it tells us um, of what's uh, taking place. Uh, it, I, this, this, for example, Revelations 4, 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So when you get to Revelations 4, he's talking about future events. And chapter 12, again, is a parenthetic. In other words, it's qualifying or it's explaining, placed or as if placed in parentheses. He wants us to pay attention to what is taking place. He wants us to be aware of what is happening. And so Ephesians 4, or Revelations 4 um, through 11 tells the story from a heavenly viewpoint. Again, Revelation 12 is a parenthetic. Revelation 13, 1 through 26 tells the story from an earthly um, perspective or from an earthly view. And then Revelation 26 through 22, 21 deals with the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment and the eternal state. Further proof of the story being told twice can be seen as you compare the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 and the seven bowls of Revelation 16. They appear to be different, however, when one considers what each trumpet bowl is affecting, it becomes, um, it becomes very clear and obvious that these are speaking concerning the same things that are going to be unfolding. They're, they're just told from a different perspective. One is told from a spiritual perspective and the other is told from a natural viewpoint. We're not going to take time to try to read every one of those, but as you go through all of those, you can see that they are affecting the same things. And so basically it's the story told twice, not two separate things that's happening. We look at them and and we see some differences. And, and so a lot of times it fools us when we see that and we begin to think that it's really two separate things that are taking place. Well, we want to make sure that we don't do that because that's not what's happening. This really makes it tough to fit things in chronologically. A good example of this can be seen in another story told twice. Uh, Matthew 8, 5 through 10. And then also... Um, Luke 7, 1 through 10. We see in Matthew chapter 8 and in Luke chapter 7, the story of the centurion. Even though when we look at these stories, we can see that it's the same instance, it's the same story. The centurion um, servant is sick and dying, and they are requesting that Jesus would come. But when you look at the two instances, one in Matthew 8, 5 through 10, and one in Luke 7, 1 through 10, you can see the story that's told twice from two different perspectives. And because there's some differences there, sometimes people want to make it two separate events when we all know that it is the same event just told from different perspectives. And so when we begin to look at that, we have to know that, that, the, that it is very important, the importance of the resurrection of the dead. Uh, one of the proofs that uh, substantiates the importance of the doctrine of the resurrection is Jesus' attitude toward those who pervert this doctrine and to whom he said, you do greatly err. Matthew chapter 22, 23 through 33 says, the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked, saying, teacher Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. 
Now there were there now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And there is the problem that we face today with almost every, every single theology, every single doctrine, everything about the scripture. This right here is at the, at the very core of our problem. And that is, Jesus says, you are mistaken. Why were they mistaken? He says, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The Bible says you do err, not knowing the scriptures. A lot of doctrines, a lot of things that we have left to educated men, and we have trusted them because they have um, uh, things behind their names like a uh, bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctorate degrees, doctor of divinities. And we have left it to them thinking that, you know, they understand the best. A lot of times the Bible says knowledge puffs up. The, uh, the, the, we no, need to understand that a lot of times education makes people educated idiots. We have to be careful because we need to know the truth. We need to know the truth, a person of Jesus Christ, but we need to educate ourselves in the truths. Now, I'm thankful that I've got people that trust me to help them with the scripture, but you cannot trust me on my own. You need to hear what I'm saying, but then go home and prove what I am saying. And so Jesus lets them know, man, you've got a problem here. Why? You're mistaken. Why are you mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Because what is he going to say? For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And so Jesus gives them this understanding that they need to, to equip themselves so that they do not find themselves in error. Mark chapter 12, 24 through 27 says, Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses and the burning bush passage? how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 18, a passage of scripture that we use for discipleship. He says, he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a worker, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But he goes on, he says, but shun profane, and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who, ha who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. What was it? They weren't rightly dividing the truth. They were ignorant of the scriptures. Um, they were um, prostituting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they found themselves being, and, and, and Paul says here, they're like a cancer on the body of Christ because they are shipwrecking the faith of others through their false teaching. Jesus wanted them to know, man, the resurrection is important. In 2 John 7, uh, 1, 7 through 11, it says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. 
This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who, abide, who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone, if anyone finds themselves, uh, or anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him un into your house or greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Very important that we make sure that we apply the word of God correctly and that we shun those that do not, or that are trying to deceive, that are trying to preach false doctrine. You know, the Bible says that we are not to take anything away from the word, neither are we to add anything to it. We have to rightly divide the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 23, I know it's a lot of verses, but they're, they're important scriptures. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Hold fast to the word that we preached to you. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than, all, than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful. pitiful, pitiful. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one uh, in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after those who are Christ's at his coming. And so we can see then that Jesus taught, Paul taught, that the resurrection was so important that if, it, if they did not believe in the resurrection, then our faith was in vain. When you look at verses 4 through 8, what I just read, along with Matthew 28, 11 through 15, which says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept, or while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Trying to deny the, the resurrection, 
of Jesus Christ, but yet this passage substantiates the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verses 12 through 19 show the effect and result of there being no resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then, there, then our faith is in vain and we remain in our sins. And so we can see the very importance of making sure that we have it right concerning the resurrection of the dead. Then verses 20 through 34 clearly teach the resurrection of the dead and its chronological order. This is very important for us so that we can have a good foundation of teaching and instructing people when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. We're going to talk more about um, the resurrection of the dead in the weeks to come, but I, I want us to know that we have already seen the first fruits of the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection is multifaceted. We see that when Jesus died, he rose again on the third day and some four to 500 people rose with him out of the grave. And so we can see a already first fruits of the resurrection that's spoken about in the scripture. We also know that the Bible says when the, la the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise. So there's going to be another resurrection um, that's going to be taking place. And so we want to learn more and we want to understand more concerning the resurrection of the dead. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little more um, later coming up. Um, before we go, I wanted to say that um, I pray the word of God touches your heart. Um, I, I pray that you are looking forward um, to the time of Jesus coming. But I want you to know that those who sleep, um, we will not hinder them. They're going to rise from the dead. There's going to be a resurrection just like Jesus rose from the dead. The dead in Christ are going to rise. Um, they're going to be caught up together with us in the clouds. And I believe, I believe, I believe today some of us are not going to die before we see the fulfillment of Christ catching us away. Some people are going to fly. I believe that time is quickly coming upon us and that some of us that are alive on this earth are going to see that day when the Lord catches away the mature ones to be with him. I, I uh, The other night I watched over again the movie that was made in the year 2000, Left Behind. And I can't even fathom that day taking place and those that thought they were ready but were not, the foolish virgins that were not ready when the bridegroom came and the first fruits were caught away and they found themselves here to dwell and live in the tribulation time. Remember, tribulation is for the saints, not the ants. Tribulation is to make ourselves ready. And then the wrath of God is going to be for those who are not um, believers, but they're the ants. And the saints at that time will be protected and sealed by God as they are upon this earth. And I, I want you to get ready. I want us to get ready. We, uh, we need to make ourselves ready. Dig deeper. Go deeper. Climb higher heights with Christ so that we can be assured of the fact that we are going to leave this place. You know, isn't it a sad thing that we're in so much in love with this natural world that we it, it really upsets us when somebody preaches about the coming of the Lord being not. But back in the early church days, man, they were so in love with Jesus. They wanted to be with him for eternity. Paul said, Paul said, I would rather go and be with Christ, but for your sakes, I remain. It wasn't because he wanted to stay here. His desire was to go and be with the Lord. But a lot of us are so earthly good that we love, we love this world so much that we're not looking forward to the coming of the Lord. We don't mind it as an, as a, as a, uh, something of where we go after we die. But we're, we're not looking for the coming of the Lord like we should. And I believe Jesus is getting ready to start putting it in our hearts, the desire, the hunger, the thirst for the coming of the Lord. Come now, Lord Jesus. And I, I believe that we're entering into that time, and I want to encourage you today, and, and I want to pray for you as we as we close here today. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
Let your Holy Spirit just touch the hearts and lives of those that are listening today. Father, quicken in them with your Holy Spirit that they would make themselves ready, that they would wash themselves in the blood of the Lamb, that they would lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset them, God that they would sanctify themselves in the truth, your word is truth, that they would be washed in the water of your word and purified by the washing of your word, God, that their minds and their hearts would be stayed upon you, that, God, they would, they would be ready, walking in the spirit, not in the flesh, that, Lord, they would be allowing the Holy Spirit to fill them up to overflowing with your oil and that their lamps would be trimmed and ready, God. That, Lord, they would not be covered in the soot, um, Father of the flames, but, God, they would, they would have the freshness of the oil and the freshness of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray in Jesus' name, God, quicken each one, touch each one, cause your word to come alive in each one. And, Father, we will continue to praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Touch people's hearts today, God. And we thank you for it. We thank you, God. Some water, some plant, some water. But God, you give the increase. Bring in the harvest, God. Bring the increase, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. And until next time, we just ask God to bless you abundantly. Amen.